Our text this morning is from the second reading for today from Revelation 21 and I'll read to you again just the one verse. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I'm making all things new. Also he said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Let's pray. Help us, Lord, to focus on what you have done and what you are doing for us, on your promises rather than what we think we may be able to do and achieve. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Do you remember the good old days? (laughs) I do. I was confirmed in 1966, the year in which the Lutheran Church of Australia was born. And here, St John's here in Tea Tree Gully was just four years old. And I've been at worship nearly every Sunday since. In 1982, when St John's turned 20, Ruth and I were in our fourth year in our first parish Uh, in the Hunter Valley in New South Wales. It was a church planting situation um, where I was the first resident pastor. We had two congregations. Uh, One had 23 baptised members. That was Maitland. That was the big one. The other one, Anna Bay, had 17. We had a great time. It was a community in which a lot of post-war migrants had settled and um, because the Greta camp was not very far away and that was one of the migrant camps after the Second World War. Uh, And so a lot of those people heard there was a a pastor and more importantly his wife and child in town. And for the first six months actually, apart from two Sundays, someone new turned up every Sunday and most of them became members. It must have been the good old days, right? Anna Bay started with 17 and when we left six years later, they still had 17. That's another story. But Maitland grew to over 100. Sadly, neither of those two congregations exists today. Her second parish was also church planting where the first resident uh, pair there, pastor and wife there, and it was in a growing suburb in Canberra, Tuggeranong, or growing region of Canberra really. Uh, Numbers of of, uh, suburbs. And uh, we started off with around 50 people and when we grew to over 160 odd, Um, I did a little bit of a look through the list and discovered just over half of those 160 people were under the age of 18. Must have been the good old days, don't you think? Public service was hiring and people were moving into town and it was wall-to-wall kids. I got to the point where I couldn't preach to dead silence. It used to sort of freak me out because there was always noise with that number of children. Today we celebrate 60 years here at St John's and we also had our good old days, didn't we? Our membership in 1985 was 894, according to the work that uh, Jenny and David have just put together. Today is about 250 about 28% of that. Our average worship attendance in 1982 was 291. In 2019, the last year before COVID, (laughs) last full year before COVID, it was 139, about 48% of that other number. In other words, at our peak, about 33% were at worship on any given Sunday. 
and in 2019 that figure was higher, 56 per cent. And of course, Good Shepherd, Para Vista and the Golden Grove congregations had also been established in that time. We once, though, I'm told, had a Sunday school with 170 kids and a vacation Bible school with 115 and 60 volunteers. So much for the history lesson. Those must have been the good days, the good old days of our church. So what do you reckon? Are the best days of St. John's already behind us? What do you think? Our past focus, of course, has been on membership and worship attendance. And you've always got to be careful what you measure because what you measure tends to shape what you do. But of course, there are many other things that are not so easy to measure as numbers like that. How well are we growing and maturing in Christ? How well are we participating in God's mission in the world? Are the good old days gone? Is it simply all downhill from here in, over these last three days, past this conference and synod? We heard some fairly alarming statistics about the church as a whole. And the number of people, the number of congregations, the number of pastors that we have. Someone projected, well, my successor, Stephen Schultz, projected that in five years' time um, we would have so many pastors and yet one year into those five years we're already halfway there. Are the good days behind us? Is it all downhill from here? What do you reckon about that picture? Could be taken in many places in Australia, couldn't it? What do you see? When you look in the rear vision mirror, what do you see? It's much like what you see out of the windscreen, isn't it? Yeah. The road behind is much like the road ahead. But that's not what the journey of the church looks like today. The road ahead of us is not like the road behind us. Our future is not going to be like our past. Things that were effective 30 and 40 years ago are not going to be as effective today. No matter how hard we work and how clever we become in running a vacation Bible school, the community around this church is not going to send their children in the way they did back then. Trying harder is not going to work. Tweaking things and just doing the same old things better is not going to deliver. There ain't going to be any quick fixes. And it's into this context that we hear the words of our Lord, of our Heavenly Father, from the throne in heaven. See, I am making all things new. Also, he said, write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Notice that he doesn't say he's going to make all new things. Right? If God was going to make all new things, there'd be no need, no use for this old thing, <laughs> or for any other old thing, for that matter. He doesn't say he's making all new things. He says he's going to make all things new. In other words, he's going to renew the things that there are. Old things like you and I, like St. John's Tea Tree Gully, God is giving us a new life. So what does the future look like? Well, 
two weeks ago, Pastor James stood here and told you he doesn't know. And I'm here to tell you I don't know either. I don't think anybody does. And that's the point. We don't have a plan to follow. We don't have a book we can read that's going to tell us this is what you need to do and it will work well. There isn't a strategic plan that we can simply adopt and then everything will work out fine. Our world is a rapidly changing place. I don't know what, if the Lord hasn't returned by then, historians are going to make of this era. But one thing is for sure, things have changed dramatically. Australia never was a Christian country, but the church was still valued and respected. And for many people today, that's no longer the case. Some of that, of course, is our own fault as church, as the Royal Commission some years ago demonstrated to our shame. But it's also our society's willful rejection of not only the Christian message, but the Christian foundations on which our society and our culture and our way of living together is built. Somehow we've come to believe that we can renounce that Christian foundation and still keep the good things that it brought us. Somehow we've come to believe as a society that we can make everything subjective and have everyone decide for themselves and it'll all turn out okay in the end. Sort of like uh, the theme song, I think it was Frank Sinatra sang, wasn't it? I did, think I did it my way. It used to be very popular at funerals some years ago. Please don't sing it at my funeral. I don't want God to be reminded of how I did things my way. That isn't going to be helpful for me at that point in time. And so, as we move forward into the future, however long God gives us, what we really need, strangely enough, is not better answers, but better questions. We don't need new surefire programs that are going to have people beating down the door to get in or even a dynamic new idea. Those days are behind us, right? They're gone. The things that God so richly blessed in the earlier years, not only of this congregation but many other congregations, are simply not going to deliver anymore. It's probably fictional, but there's the story of a congregation who, when they were challenged to be culturally relevant, said, well, we're culturally relevant to the 1950s, and if they ever come around again, we'll be ready. <laughs> well, they're not coming around again, and we don't become culturally relevant in any case by trying to copy the world. We do that by sharing that timeless message of what God has done for the world he created that rebelled against him and willfully decided to do it their own way. The future means we're going to need to mine much more deeply into the basics of who we are, the foundations of who we are as the forgiven people of God because Jesus died for us. And Father has made us new. It's incomplete, but it's real. We're spirit-filled. And so led by the Spirit. And so the journey that lies ahead of us, well, of course, there are some things that don't change. There are some things that don't change from the past. In fact, if anything, we go back to them more firmly than ever. But many of the other things that we've done will change. 
as God leads us into a new path. As I said, questions are more important than answers at this point. The question should not be what new program can we introduce, but what is God doing in our community and how can we join in? Not so much what can we do for God, but what is God already doing for us? How do we bring our Christian witness and word and deed to everyday life? Now, of course, these are not new questions. The early church asked them already. The early church already grappled with such issues. And I dare say the future we're moving into is going to look more like the year 50 than the year 1950. It's more like a journey. Use whatever illustration you find helpful, navigating a ship or finding your way through a strange city. The issue is discernment, not iron class pants. The issue is listening to God and one another as we move into the future so that we hear God's call and follow him. And so being flexible and being prepared to experiment and being prepared, therefore, to fail. As we move into the future with 60 years behind us and who knows how many in front of us, either as a congregation uh, or, for that matter, uh, as individuals, we look not to what we can do, but to what God is doing and what he's promised to do. And that's where I believe that this word from God and his sitting seated on the throne, God our Father, speaks directly to us because it focuses us on what he is doing. The Father's promise that he is making all things new. That's why Jesus came, to bring forgiveness, new life and salvation. We don't know what the future is going to bring. We know it won't be a repeat of the past, but not what it will, it will actually look like. But we know who's already there. Our Heavenly Father is already there. Jesus is already there. The Holy Spirit is already there. Forgiveness is already there. God is still at work in our world, bringing forgiveness, life, and salvation. And so we can move into that confidence, even so we can move into that future, even an unknown future, with confidence and hope, because we have that promise of God ringing in our ears. Behold, I make all things new. Let's pray. Help us, Lord, whatever may happen, whatever the future may hold, to keep our eyes firmly fixed on Jesus, to keep our eyes firmly fixed on you and your promises. Teach us, Lord, to place our hope not in what we can do or what we can achieve, but on what you are doing and your mission to your world that you call us to be part of. Keep our eyes fixed on Jesus until that day when you call us home or when Jesus returns, that we may walk with you in faith, love and hope. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.